Hello and welcome to Friday's Granada Reports, live with the news across the northwest. Hello there, thanks for joining us. Here's what's coming up on the programme tonight. Jacob Billington was stabbed to death by a paranoid schizophrenic. Today, a coroner ruled his killer was released from prison without support before the knife rampage. This case is horribly familiar. We see time and time again people are not learning from these cases. I made a judgment call that didn't end up in the position where I expected it to. Speaking for the first time since hundreds of MPs walked out of a debate on Gaza, Chorley MP Sir Lindsay Hoyle tells us he's had death threats. As events take place to mark International Women's Day, we ask, does it hit the right mark anymore? We're not asking for more than what we truly deserve. We deserve equality, whether it's in jobs, whether it's in childcare, mental health. They're skating for your vote, but who else is hoping our Northwest Dancing on Ice finalists will be flying high? And in the weather, the weekend is just round the corner, and I know you'll be absolutely bursting to find out what the forecast is, so stay tuned. All the details coming up. So please stay with us for all of that. First tonight, a coroner's ruled a man from Crosby was stabbed to death after systemic failures allowed his killer to be freed from prison without mental health support. University worker Jacob Billington, who was 23, was one of several people attacked by paranoid schizophrenic Zephaniah McLeod in Birmingham in 2020. McLeod often refused to take medication as he believed it contained homing devices. The coroner said there was no coordinated approach to his treatment. Jacob's mum said it meant a dangerous man whose risk was well known simply walked out of jail and disappeared. Emma Sweeney has this report. Ambulance service. Is Bobby, the patient breathing? Now someone's been stabbed. He's been stabbed. Is he breathing? Yeah, Bobby, street timing. He's been stabbed. He's losing consciousness. Right, where are you? How old's the patient? Um, Roughly. 23. I can the siren's coming now. Hmm? I've just been found out. Someone else has been stabbed now. He's, next, he's been stabbed in the neck. September 2020. And what had started as an ordinary night on the streets of Birmingham would end in carnage. Zephaniah McLeod, a paranoid schizophrenic, had undertaken a random 90-minute stabbing spree. By the time he'd finished, he'd injured seven and had stolen the life of 23-year-old Jacob Billington from Crosby. My son Jacob was a fantastic young man who lost his life in horrific circumstances at the hands of an extremely mentally Ill, Ill individual who had stabbed seven other innocent people on that night. This is every parent's nightmare and it became our reality. Come to us, walk down to us, Zephaniah. Keep your hands where we can see him. A reality that today's inquest would conclude was due to multiple failings across several agencies. Failings that enabled McLeod, a known violent offender, to be released from prison just months earlier without any support in place for his serious mental illness for which he refused to take medication. He was released from prison with no supervision at the end of his sentence and there was no effective release planning for this dangerous individual and the risk to the public was never seriously considered. Services failed to such an extent that it was not known where he was or even what city he was in. We also found out that McLeod had been subject to enhanced public protection arrangements but was removed from this six months before release simply because he was not complying with the process. One charity that's been working with Jacob's family since the tragedy unfolded say better support needs to be in place for mentally ill individuals. See, time and time again, people are not learning from these cases. We see people who are seriously unwell are unable or unwilling to get good care and treatment. They need more assertive care and treatment and they're falling between the cracks. We see very poor practice of joined up working between all the agencies. Today, the coroner said she'd write a report to prevent future deaths, which would highlight her concerns with the management of McLeod's release and lack of interagency working. One, two, three, four. You said you saw something in me. Too late for the family of this talented drummer who say they'll never recover from their loss. 
but there's hope that today's ruling may just protect others in future. Emma Sweeney, ITV News. Well, all of the agencies involved in Zephaniah McLeod's care have told us they will take the coroner's concerns on board and have already made improvements where needed. Next tonight, the Chorley MP and common speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle, has told Granada Reports he's received death threats after making a controversial decision around a debate on Gaza. In his first interview since the incident at an event in his constituency, he insisted he wasn't threatened, intimidated or offered anything to allow a vote which angered a number of MPs. Well, our political correspondent, Tom Sheldrick, is live at Westminster. Tom, first of all, remind us of what happened. Yes, Sir Lindsay Hall was elected uh, many times as the Labour MP for Chorley, but now has no party affiliation as the Speaker overseeing proceedings in the House of Commons. This all kicked off around a fortnight ago on a day when the Scottish National Party got to set the agenda. They put forward a motion calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, which could have exposed divisions within the Labour Party. But the Speaker allowed a vote on a Labour amendment, which made things easier for them. A number of SNP and Conservative MPs walked out of the chamber in protest and there were claims that the Speaker had been threatened by the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer. He has denied that and here's what Sir Lindsay told us today. I didn't bottle to anybody's pressure. I wasn't threatened, intimidated or offered anything. What I do say is maybe I've got to start doing politics again. What I do is care about people and I care about MPs of all parties and maybe... Sometimes you've got to do politics, but in the end, I did it for the right reason, not the wrong reason. Well, when he apologised in Parliament, Sir Lindsay Hoyle said he wanted to let all sides express their views on a sensitive uh, subject and was worried about the safety of politicians. And indeed, he told us today uh, that death threats have been made against him since uh, this uh, controversy. He also said he'd received messages of support from around the world. Now, 94 MPs have signed a motion of no confidence in him as Speaker, though that's only increased by one over the last week. And he said today that he had the majority of Parliament backing him and hopes to continue in the job. Uh, finally, the main parties traditionally don't stand candidates uh, against the Speaker in their constituency. There has, though, been talk of the Conservatives challenging him in Chorley at the general election. Sir Lindsay suggested today he'd be relaxed about that and said it was part of democracy. Tom in Westminster tonight, thank you very much. This evening's other news, a fire brigade watchdog has <coughs> commended Greater Manchester's Fire and Rescue Service for improvements and described it as performing well. The fire inspectorate graded the service across 11 areas and found it was good in 10 and adequate in one. The watchdog said it had congratulated the service on its performance. Preparations have begun for the return of Bluebird to the Ruskin Museum in Coniston this weekend. The craft lay at the bottom of Coniston Water for 34 years after Donald Campbell died, attempting to break his own water speed record. The wreckage was recovered in 2001, but there was a long battle over ownership as it was restored. Mr Campbell's daughter, Gina, always promised Bluebird would return. It's, it's going to be extremely hard for me to, to see her again because I will never forget that my father died in her. But equally so, I will never forget how beautiful she was and is. People who have never seen her will walk into the Ruskin Museum and their jaws will fall down to their laps. Don't doubt that for a minute. No, It'd be quite indeed. poignant, won't it? Just a bit. It's International Women's Day, a date that's been celebrated by some and criticised by others here in the North West. Supporters say it's a chance to push for greater equality and call for change where discrimination still exists. But some campaigners say it's nothing more than an empty gesture seized upon by some businesses and organisations who don't live up to their word in terms of pay and opportunities for women. Claire Hannah reports. Everyone around us is like in a good environment and they're all like pushing you to be who you want to be, like, do it matter about how confident you are or anything? It's just a really good environment to be in because, like, all girls playing football and that. 
250 girls from 19 schools playing football as part of the She Inspires project set up by Merseyside Police and the Police and Crime Commissioner. It's something we've been running for a couple of years, but it's brilliant that today the football tournament and the work we're doing is coinciding with uh, International Women's Day. Really important for um, our young women growing up in Merseyside. It's about increasing their confidence and giving them information and knowledge about how to stay safe. International Women's Day was set up almost 50 years ago to promote equality. And looking at this today, all these girls supporting each other is part of what it's about. For generations there have been these barriers that women have faced, whether it's been about violence and abuse, whether it's about you know not getting paid fairly in the workplace. You know, we have to acknowledge that women have been denied these opportunities. And so having a day, a year, you know, is not a lot to ask in terms of, of recognising those barriers and doing something about it. But but I also think it's important to know that actually supporting women you know, in leadership positions, empowering women, removing those barriers, it benefits everybody. Not everyone is celebrating though. The women's organisation in Liverpool thinks some of the message has been lost. When women start to ask for what they want, they're called bossy or mouthy. And really, women are just asking to be treated respectful. They just, they just want equality. They're doing the same type of work as men. They would like the same pay as men. So when women start to complain or ask for the rights that are due to them, what happens is there is an expectation that they're just moaning or complaining and they really belong in the kitchen. They shouldn't be working, they're taking men's jobs. These girls definitely not taking the men's jobs, but working together to bridge the gap. We're all equal, we're all humans, aren't we? So why should we be, people should be treated different. We need to be, support each other. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter who you are, you just need to support each other. Claire Hanna, ITV News, Liverpool. Well, joining us in the studio now is Lisa Maynard Atem, a women's rights campaigner. But you're not convinced of the value of International Women's Day. Why? I just feel like over the last couple of years, um, what we're seeing is a lot of superficial gestures, actions and events that don't really kind of move the needle in terms of um, the advancement of women's issues, whether it's health, whether it's education, finance, business. Um, you know, you see a lot of things like, you know, cupcakes or heart-shaped hands. And, you know, whilst those things have their place, I don't think their place is in the fight for equality. Or posters by big companies who do cupcakes and yeah. love hands and what have you and still don't pay their yeah, women and, the same... and still pay their women 12.5% less than they pay their men. Like, that's just hypocrisy. That difference, those inequalities are still so stark. And it's not just work opportunities and pay, it's a lot, lot more, isn't it? There is a lot more. Like, if we look at, you know, women wanting to return to work after having a child, I know women who are not able to, to return to work because they can't afford childcare. You know, if you look at, you look at some parts of the world, look at Roe versus Wade in America, women are actually having to come out and fight for the right to make decisions about their own bodies. You know, while, you know, having things like International Women's Day is fantastic, it, it just feels to me like it's been diluted, you know, and I don't, I don't really see how it kind of impacts change. I don't really see how it's going to bring about meaningful change. You know, according to studies and research, we're still over 100 years away from closing the gender pay gap. So, you know, when, when you look at it from that standpoint, like I say, I think Inter International Women's Day has its place, but we need to take decisive action. And the reality is, you know, cupcakes and hot shake hands are not going to achieve the things that we want to achieve. It's a view shared by the women's organisation in Liverpool, as we heard yes. in that report. Do you think us women should just boycott all this posturing, as you'd call it? I don't... I think, there, like I said before, there is a place for that, but I don't think it is in the fight to achieve parity and equity uh, for women. I just, I, just don't, I just don't see how we're going to achieve the things that we need to achieve in order to move women forward, because it's not just about gender pay. There's the gender health gap. There is the gender wealth gap. There are so many, so many issues. You know, in parts of the world, girls and women can no longer be educated. And I also think it's important that we, should, we demonstrate to our young girls and our young women the type of action that results in change. You know, if they see me baking cakes, like, well, what's that going to do? Yeah, I just, you know, don't get me wrong, I love a cake, but it's not going to achieve the aims and outcomes that we want to achieve, is we it? We all love cake. <laughs> we all love cake. Those rights are enshrined in law. They're meant yes. to be enshrined in law. So why is that not working? Is the structure not there in the first place? I think, I think for me, um, 
I, I don't feel that the structures and systems in place are designed for everyone, which is why they don't work for everyone. If we go back through history, they weren't designed by diverse groups of people, so therefore they're not going to work for the whole of society. And I think that's the problem. Another issue I find as well is accountability. You know, we still don't call people out, and I can understand why, because people are scared to speak out. But un until we start challenging people, challenging the status quo, and calling people out and holding people accountable, things will not change. Lisa, thanks very much for thanks coming for having in. Me. Now, one big supporter of International Women's Day is the Chorley businesswoman Susie Orr, whose breast cancer treatment we've been following on this programme. She's still building up her strength after surgery and months of treatment, but as a business networker, she chose today to launch a cause close to her heart. She's enlisted the help of Sir Lindsay Hoyle, who you saw earlier tonight, to help other cancer patients. Elaine Wilcox reports. Happy International Women's Day! Just seven months after breast cancer surgery, it's no surprise Susie Orr was back at work today and with a mission to buy new equipment for the hospital where she was treated. If Chorley Hospital get that machine, it will make a difference to any woman that's going through breast cancer like I did. It would mean that they could have the radiotherapy treatment at the point of the surgery. Um, it would make Chorley a centre of excellence, it would make such a huge difference and I'm determined to get that money for Chorley. After weeks of making headlines himself, Common Speaker and Chorley MP was keen to show his support. She's been on a journey and she reminds others about that journey, but has raised awareness, raised money and always been a great campaigner. And now once again, she's launched the campaign to buy this portable equipment that are going to make a difference for women's lives. This is great news for Jolly Hospital and I cannot say, Susie, thanks for what you do. You are our true hero. Susie didn't have any symptoms. Her breast cancer was picked up after a routine mammogram. Sharing her story, we filmed as her tumour was removed and during chemo and radiotherapy. This new machine costs £500,000. There are just two in the UK in London. I still have patients coming to the Chorley Breast Unit saying because they saw Susie share her journey on TV, they're not missing their mammograms and they're regularly checking their breasts. I still hear that every day. Her surgeon says Susie has undoubtedly helped to save lives. So nothing's a big ask for Susie. You know, she's a lady who says why not rather than why. So if she's somebody who's going to be able to you know, spearhead the funds for this, alongside charity then we will certainly support her and, and only encourage that because it will help help breast cancer patients to share our story and to raise funds to improve facility is fantastic i've been inundated by people customers who come into my store in Chorley, who said i saw susie on the news i've gone and got a mammogram and i have two ladies who've had results that needed actioning and they wouldn't have known if they hadn't have watched Susie's story. She's really inspired so many women and the impact is enormous. Typically Susie, her foundation was launched with breasts on the bonnet of a car to get the message out. With a big fundraising target, she can't do this herself and is asking businesses for support. Elaine Wilcox, ITV News, Chorley. Let's hope lots and lots of businesses come forward for that. Let's find out what's on the ITV News at Six City with Gamal. Coming up on the evening news, undercover for years with the IRA, but did this British spy cost more lives than he saved? The UK joins a new international effort to ship aids to Gaza. The huge number of nurses applying to work abroad is Britain facing a nursing exodus. And meanwhile, the exodus of Tory MPs continues as Theresa May announces she is set to stand down. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. We're moving on to sport now and the title race hots up this weekend with Liverpool facing Manchester City and a poignant moment on the touchline. Here's Chris. Yeah, can't wait for this one. Ever since Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp arrived in England, this has been the standout fixture in the Premier League. But with Klopp leaving Liverpool at the end of this season, this could be the last time these mega managers go head to head in this country. So today they've been paying tribute to each other and a rivalry that's enthralled England. English football, as David Chisnell reports. It's a rivalry that's dominated recent Premier League history, as champions and challengers Pep Guardiola and Jurgen Klopp have pushed each other to their limits in their pursuit to be the best. 
But with Klopp departing Liverpool at the end of the season, Sunday's showdown with Manchester City at Anfield could be the last time we see them on the sidelines together. We know we are good, we know the opponent is really good, and now let's play the game. Pep is the best manager in the world. I have no problem, I have a really good life with being not even close to that. It's absolutely fine, believe it. I know I, I'm, I'm not bad, but we ask me about the best, and for me he's the best. In the Premier League is the last time, but maybe in the FA Cup we can find. I respect completely his decision. I spoke with him and I had the feeling that he would be back sooner or later. So he's a, a man, he loves football, his passion is there. This way, please, Jürgen. Since their arrivals here eight years ago, City and Liverpool have been dominant, winning Premier Leagues and Champions Leagues, as well as FA and League Cups. They defend the club, not responding to this guy, you know, but they have done many years on the pitch, every single three days. That is the best way, so if we have done it, I could answer him, but why? So, <laughs> honestly. One of our slogans, what I love, is, is this means more. And it means more to us. Somebody says what he thinks, and then the whole world tells you, that's not right, what you think. Nothing wrong with what Trent said, to be honest, from my point of view. Once again, Liverpool and City are locked in a battle at the top of the table. While Klopp and Guardiola may not be close friends, a healthy respect has developed between these two. When we were honoured to get the Honour Hall of Fame with the Jürgen years ago, we spent time with the families, and but in terms of lunch, dinners, or never happened. We have to decide who pays, that's why we didn't do it. We had not opportunity to, to meet each other more often, but we would have a lot to talk about, <laughs> definitely. Sunday's Premier League meeting will be the 30th managerial matchup between Guardiola and Klopp. One last epic encounter would be a fitting finale to this touchline tussle. David Chisnell, ITV News. Sometimes seasons are, uh, are going like we are now in, but uh, we don't accept that. We will fight. Um, we have, uh, have had problems, we still have problems uh, with, uh, in our squad, with injury-wise. But uh, with the players who are available, we will fight for it. Now, I know we all like to sit down and watch a good bit of telly at the weekend. And on Sunday, we have not one, but two Northwest celebrities skating for your vote in the Dancing on Ice final. Yes, the former Radio 1 DJ Adele Roberts, who's from Southport, and Manchester actor Ryan Thomas have both made it through. Question is, who will be crowned the winner and who's supporting them from across our region? Our entertainment correspondent, Caroline Whitmore, went to find out. The Dancing on Ice trophy is in touching distance. Jessica, you are a massive fan of Adele Roberts, who is in the final of Dancing on Ice this weekend. She's from Southport, you're from Seaforth. Tell me, why else are you a massive fan of Adele? Um, because she has a stomach like me. It's like a button on your tummy that um, really helps you. Adele Roberts, she's so open about her bowel cancer, about her stoma. How does that make you feel as a mum of a little girl who has exactly the same thing? It's amazing really to be able to see other people out there and especially on the TV. It helps the children understand that they, they can actually go out and do anything they want to do. Adele invited me and Hunter to there and I've always looked up to her because she's really brave. It says Team Adele and Mark and underneath that it says Audrey where Adele Stomer is. My Stomer's name is called Apple. Here at Our Ladies, Star of the Sea in Seaforth, you have got everybody supporting Adele and Mark and Audrey, haven't you? I've asked them to make posters and I've got 30 people in my class. Everybody said that they're going to vote for Adele, Audrey and Mark. Go Adele, Audrey and Mark! Yeah! Tell me quick, ain't that a kick? He saw Ryan playing Jason Grimshaw for 16 years on Coronation Street. His on-screen mum, Sue Cleaver, has sent him a message. Hi Ryan, it's your other mother here, just saying I'm so incredibly proud of you. I'm not surprised because you've been skating on thin ice for years. Uh, I love you lots, good luck, see you soon. Ryan, oh my gosh, you're in the final. I'm sending you so much love and good luck for Sunday night. You're gonna be amazing. 
Love you loads and have a great night. You've got this. Hiya, Adele and Ryan here. We want to send the biggest love to yeah, Granada. Granada before our favourite. The Northwest two Northerners in the final. Make sure you vote Adele. No. Vote <laughs> Adele. All vote right. Vote Ryan. Vote Ryan. <laughs> vote whoever you want. They're all amazing, but this Northern right here deserves <laughs> it all. We love her. Granada and Post, we love you so much. Lots of love. It's time. We've got everything crossed for all of them, yeah. but will it be telly-watching weather on Sunday? Emma has your details. Why do I need a shower? I've been out in the rain. The faster you go, the sooner you'll be out. You'll save water too. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Hello there. Hope you're enjoying your Friday night and that you're all ready for the weekend. Sonia Turkington captured this absolutely spectacular photo of a comet earlier this week under the clearer skies. Now, this is one of the brightest known comets. It's due to get higher as the month wears on. But of course, we need clear skies to view it. And I'm not sure we're going to get those over the next few days and nights. A lot of cloud cover around. There will be one or two breaks, but also some rain inbound over the weekend. And that's all down to a couple of areas of low pressure down to the south of us here flinging these frontal systems up into the UK and they will push northwards. There will be some showers around tomorrow but mostly patchy moving north and westwards and then after that more in the way of rain Saturday night into Sunday. Bit of a respite on Monday into Tuesday. But rewinding to the next few hours and we still have some brisk winds continuing from the east during the overnight period. Also a lot of cloud cover, some mist and hill fog. Too breezy for temperatures to fall too far though there. And still gusts of 30 miles an hour at the coast and 40 miles an hour over the hills overnight and into tomorrow. Talking of which, the sun is up on Saturday at about 20 to 7 in the morning, sets about 5 past 6 in the afternoon. And it's going to be a little bit of a damp start to the day with some patchy rain pushing north and westwards, but not many of us will see a lot of that. And then there will be a clearance later in the afternoon, so some improvement and some glimmers of brightness, in fact, not feeling too bad in the sunshine into the afternoon possibly feeling slightly milder than it did today but then turning wet from the south overnight and certainly damp so a wet unsettled start to Sunday still quite breezy maybe a little bit brighter later on the brightest day is going to be Tuesday but cloudy and dry on Monday bye bye United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada weather Thank you, Emma. That is Granada Reports this Friday evening. There is more on our website. Just go to itv.com slash Granada. I'll be back for the late news after news at 10 with that all-important rugby result. Hope you can join me, but until then, have a great evening and thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs>